Welcome once again. My name is Aziza Hassan, and I have the pleasure of leading New Ground. Um, we are so grateful that you're willing to be part of this conversation. I myself am deeply inspired by Rachel's book. We share the same sky, and I'm excited to dive into it with her today. And I also want to acknowledge um, why we had to reschedule our session, the, that shooting um, and the awful that has unfolded ever since Buffalo was really, uh, has really shuck, sh shaken up our world. Um, and what we found is that, and, and many have found, is that uh, that incident, what made it like the manifesto from that incident, the shooter was also referencing um, uh, other shootings of, of mosques and, and, and there's all these connections to synagogues and other, this, this hatred and this ideology of the shooter um, is, unfortunately, something that was inspired by other places. Um, and so it's really important to, for, to, to pause and to think about how we can really be there for each other. Um, and that's why it was really important for us to show up uh, and be there for our friends um, and to stand with them so that we could really kind of hold space. Um, and in so many ways, it felt eerily connected to Rachel's very moving man memoir of her grandmother's experience. Um, and I'm really eager to dive in more today and how, and like, cause she's really this incredible bridge between this, this journey, um, and what's going on in our world today. And so, um, before we go into the introduction of Rachel Sorodi with Andrea, I just want to give you an overview. Our plan is to have a conversation with the author, um, uh, and then we'll, uh, have space for you to ask questions. And then at one o'clock, um, Rachel will sign off and we will go into our breakout rooms for anybody who's willing to uh, continue the conversation and kind of uh, an unpack. And then we'll come back and we'll close out by two o'clock. So you are uh, welcome to be part of the, the entire uh, two hour journey or to, um, and actually we hope you will be, um, or if you really need to sign off by 12, then we leave that to you. Uh, and I think I said two o'clock, it's actually one o'clock, so it's 11 now. I just kind of did map incorrectly. So without further ado, I will pass it to Andrea, our um, Associate Director of Newground. So welcome everyone. We're so grateful you're here. And Rachel, we are so grateful to have you with us. Rachel Sorati, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, yeah, Sarati. Yep. Yes, Sarati is an award-winning author, photographer, educator, and audio producer. Her work explores the intergenerational impact of war and the inheritance of memory. She's currently the inaugural storyteller in residence at the USC Shoah Foundation, even though she resides on the East Coast. In 2019, Rachel released her first podcast, We Share the Same Sky. Um, it was the first ever narrative podcast based on a Holocaust survivor's testimony. And it tells the story of her decade long journey to retrace her grandmother's war story, which for those of you who were able to, to really dig in, um, understand the parallel nature of those stories, which is really important. Um, we Share the Same Sky was listed as one of the best podcasts of the year by HuffPost and made numerous other lists. It is being taught in high school classrooms around the world. Her critically acclaimed debut memoir, which we're discussing today was released in August, 2021. It won the Maine Literary Award, received a starred review from Publishers Weekly and was listed as one of the best books of the month by Apple Books. So Rachel, welcome and welcome to everyone for this conversation. I'd like to, to start um, at, in this like par parallel nature of your stories, of your, your story and your grandmother's story. Under different conditions, you both developed deep and life-altering relationships that spanned cultures, geography, faiths, all kinds of different divides. This is really important to us in New Ground. Um, for you, what are some of the most important values that are inherent in this reaching outward or reaching across? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for being here with me and for taking time with my story. It's it's really um, a privilege to get to speak with your community and be a part of it. Um, yeah, well, you know, I, I think that having started this work so young, 
I was in college when I started my interest in my grandmother's story started to take form and take shape a bit. And so in many ways, a lot of the themes that have come out of this book in terms of creating a lot of those cross-cultural relationships have really become the way in which like my own personal relationships have been built. So it's like, I can speak to the importance of it from like a professional political space, but also it's become so integrated in my own personal life that I almost can't imagine a world in which, you know, I'm only interacting with people who come from similar backgrounds as I do. And one of the things that I picked up very quickly because I had started, um, following my grandma or taking an interest in my grandmother's story and starting these storytelling sessions with her just before I moved to Jerusalem to study abroad at an international school for a year. So those two things were happening simultaneously in my life where I was starting to get really interested in history and the relevance of it in present day while studying at an international university with students from all across different, you know, uh, cultural backgrounds, country, linguistic, uh, religious. And so these two things were integrating into themselves very naturally. And um, more often than not, I found that people who I assumed were quite similar to I was, were actually quite different. And people who I thought were quite different were actually quite similar in many ways because yeah, maybe I would meet someone else who was Jewish of European descent, but they grew up in Europe. So they had a completely different relationship to their Judaism or you know, to the to their ethnic background, their the way that they spoke, their language came out differently. Whereas I could meet someone who had a different religious background and a different skin color than I did, but we both came from the Northeast in America. And so suddenly we were really similar in some ways. And I think reestablishing what it meant to like be different than someone or be similar than someone was something that came in very quickly uh, with this project. And then it just became so important that for the more diversity of narrative and the more diversity of understanding of history I could find, the more like layered and nuanced and connected I felt to the story. Um, and so that just became a really important thing that I sought out, but it also happened very naturally. Yeah. And I think for my grandmother as well, you know, like she, as much as she was forced to migrate, and that's such a big part of the story, um, she also really loved travel and she really loved adventure. And way, you know, up to the day she died, she was taking trips and she put a very big emphasis and a very big value on meeting people unlike her and seeing places that were unfamiliar to her. It's so beautiful. Um, it's like you you really draw us in especially draw me in especially with this example like I'm I come from a mixed background and it's like so I feel so much more at ease like when I when it is mixed around me and it's hard to separate and yet it really makes you grapple with questions of what does it mean to help people feel like they belong and they're connected and I'm really struck by this passage in the book where you describe that your grandmother is like mistreated or there's this meanness in this home and it it, it's so unsettling. It allow it. She helped. She feels disconnected. Um, while when she transitions to another home where she's treated better, she actually feels belonging and security and happiness. And I'm I'm wondering like um, what your thoughts are and like what does it mean and why is it important to belong across difference. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> to give a bit of context to the to the home that you're describing, so. When my grandmother was forced to flee Czechoslovakia in 1939, she went to Denmark and where it was relatively safe. But um, the goal was eventually to go on to Palestine. That's like that was the way that they were able to get out of um, Czechoslovakia, but they didn't because of the war. So every six months she's moving from home to home. And this really becomes the first example in her story of how important the role of strangers are in our own um in our own spiritual resistance, in our own mental health, in the way that we get through really difficult and unimaginable situations. Because in each of these homes, she was safe. The De Denmark was relatively safe. Um, so it wasn't that her livelihood was at risk. And, but depending, you know, from her diaries, we know this, that depending on how those families treated her, um, whether or not they invited her to sit at a meal with them as part of the family, whether or not they invited her to be a part of, you know, Christmas gatherings or come to the grandparents' home or whatever, you know, she really had a different relationship with her own experience as a refugee. And 
you know, what's so important about that example to me is that in a world that feels so incredibly overwhelming, increasingly so on the day to day, you know, I, I personally feel like I don't have control so often where I'm like, what do I do? And then you look at an example like that, you're like, wow. So, so just inviting someone to a meal can actually have a ripple effect generations down the line where I'm sitting here as her granddaughter saying that I know that she was doing better in this situation because someone was just simply kind to her on a day to day. Like I think sometimes we don't put enough stock into our day-to-day -day interactions. And so that's where like that, that's the first example of many examples in her story. And, um, you know, it, it, it becomes the thing that moves her forward. And, you know, she even has this beautiful passage uh, where it's actually one of the last letters she writes home before her parents are deported and the communication stops is that she's right about, she has just moved in, she's 16 and has just moved into this woman's home. And she writes about how it feels like home and it's not perfect like home, but she has no other words than home. And she's walking and she's singing and, you know, she's starting to feel like she belongs. So even though she's an outsider, even though she's at risk, even though soon enough, she's gonna have to flee again, even though she doesn't know that yet, um, in this brand new place, she feels like she belongs because the people around her tell her she does. And it's just that, you know, it, like, it sounds so simple that it's almost like, well, it's, it's like so simple. It can sound hokey in a sense where you're like, just tell someone they belong. But like, that's really the power that we have for each other. Um, you know, and, and you can, you can use that in your own neighborhood, right? That doesn't have to be a wartime situation to enact a life lesson like that. And that's something that I've really loved about getting to work with so many, you know, wartime testimonies is that you pull out these lessons and, you know, you pull out all of these examples that you're like, well, I don't need a war to put this into practice. This is just how humans should treat each other because in the worst of times, we also treat each other in the best of ways. So depending which examples you look for. Thank you, Rachel, so much for kind of just coming right in and making those connections that we all need right now. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your conversation with your mom around trauma. I found it really interesting. Um, our, I feel as a facilitator at Newground, I sometimes feel like a lot of our work is uh, because almost everyone who comes into our space has some sort of trauma from displacement at some point in their family history. It might be near, it might be further back. Um, so I, I was interested, um, you know, I think that we can sometimes get stuck in our own trauma. I think your mother was getting at this. It can stand in the way of our really being able to do the deep listening that we need to do. Um, so I, I was interested in hearing sort of how you felt personally about this comment that you included from your mother. She says, how are we going to make a better world if you carry these, these feelings with you all the time? There's joy in the sadness. And I was really interested in that, that particular phrase and would love to hear what you think it means. Um, there's joy in the sadness, but there's sometimes prejudice that comes from having a certain pain and everyone has their own. The knowledge is good, but I don't want you to feel what I feel. Yeah. <clears throat> so just, um, okay. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it, it's always really interesting to me, like what from the book or from the podcast that folks resonate with, right? Because, you know, you have the war and you've inter intergenerational trauma and you have the widowhood. So there's all these different spaces that that folks can, you know, connect to. And, and this, like the passing down of this trauma is one that I think that, like it could be the universal thing that we're all we're all trying to reckon with and from our various cultural corners. Um, but my mother gave me a huge gift when she said, I don't want you to feel the pain that I feel. And those words didn't come out until uh, I was making the podcast. And I actually had my co-producer interview my mom. I was sitting in the room, but I like felt like I couldn't be the one to really talk to her about it. Um, but I needed to be there. So she was like talking to me, but filtered through. <laughs> um, and I think about it all the time because there's a lot of guilt that also comes with trauma and the guilt comes in a lot of different ways. But I think once you get down to the third generation, which is, you know, the millennial generation of Holocaust survivors, um, you know, we are, we're a bit further away from this history and our parents have carried a lot of it for us. And so when we don't feel as pained by it, I think that there can feel some guilt in there of like, I intellectually know that this awful, horrible thing happened. I intellectually understand that I am still a living representation of this horrible thing that happened. 
but my life is good. I'm in a relatively safe place in society. You know, I'm in a relatively well-off income bracket, you know, all of these things like my life. And there's all these other awful, horrible things happening in the world and people who are far higher risk because of their identities than I am. And I think sometimes we have a hard time grappling with that. How much pain should I be carrying in it? Am I carrying enough? And I, at least, um, you know, storytelling is so present in Jewish culture that, you know, all of our holidays are about remembering our pain. And I think that there comes this question of, well, if I'm not carrying it in a way that it hurts all the time, am I not connected to my family history? So my mom really gave me a gift when she said, I don't want you to feel the pain that I feel. It was like a release in some way, because in no way was that, you know, what was she expressing was forget what you know, or don't learn or don't pay attention. Um, it was more of just like, you know, this lesson that for us to move forward, we have to let things go. That it's just, it's just how it has to be. Um, and I think I needed to be told that in a way, like a, as a form of release. And then going to the to the joy and the sadness piece. Um, this is this is like a, a big thing that came in after my husband passed away because prior to that, you know, I didn't really know grief in that way. I lost my grandmother, I lost other grandparents, you know, I lost my family dog. Like, you know, I had gone through, through, I had friends who died when I was younger, but, but a loss of a spouse is like a very different intimate form of grief. And so suddenly like I had to operate in this space in a way that I got just a little bit closer to my grandmother in the sense that I got closer in the sense that I didn't, I knew I would never understand. I think before that I had some hope in a sense that if I were to, was to keep learning and to keep digging and to keep researching and to keep talking, to keep documenting and all these things, that maybe suddenly I would have this moment where I was like, oh, I get it. And I think what that deep grief really taught me was like, nope, the point is not to get it. That's not the goal here. Um, and, you know, I was very appreciative of that lesson, but what I could understand a bit deeper was that like when you have such extreme darkness in whatever way it comes in your life, once that light reemerges, it is like the brightest light in the world. Like, you know, if you don't listen to music for six months after someone passes away because you're grieving and then music comes back, it's like <laughs> you've never heard such a, you know, a beautiful sound in your life. And so this joy in the sadness piece comes in where it's like, you know, when the sadness is that deep, the joy that you feel to be alive, to be with each other, to be able to practice being a Jewish person, whether you're, however, whatever that means to you, um, I think it becomes that much sweeter and that much more meaningful. And, you know, and then speaking to some of the relationships that I built in, you know, throughout, through doing all this work was like, those are some of the closest people in my life now. And our relationships only exist because this awful thing happened in history. And that's another layer of grief too, that can, some guilt can, to, can usher in. Um, but like, it's been so joyful to have those relationships. Like it's been the greatest joy of, of my like adult life has been building the relationships with Rabbi Bent Melchior in Denmark and Sine and the Danish, you know, farming family and all these other people. And I can't imagine not having them, but that only comes from this dark period of history. And so, you know, there's just this kind of balance that you're trying to shuffle around a bit with it. Oh, I'm really struck by that deep meaning of like these relationships that matter and are so impacting, especially from those moments of, of deep pain. Um, yeah, I'm just holding that personally. Um, it really speaks to me. I um, Another part that really kind of hit me, it was uh, you highlight the importance of education in your grandmother's story and her determination to have to not have it taken away from her. So she's doing chores early in the morning so she can get to class by 8.30. And I, uh, this resonates because my dad, who's uh, Palestinian and like his families and, and many other families are so obsessed with education as a means of proving worth. And it's like your ticket to dignity. Like that's the one thing that will give you dignity. Um, I'm wondering if you can describe more of this commitment um, and what it looked like for your grandmother. Yeah, and it's interesting to hear that for you, education was like a path to dignity because, you know, I've never used that word in that context, but I could like kind of see how that, that would relate here too. Um, for my grandmother, the, the phrase that got passed down that she said that her father always said to her was, 
you know, learn, 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 you know, what's in your head, no one could take away from you. And so it was more of like this, and you know, that does relate to dignity in, in a big way. And so that that's what was so important. Like they can take away your home, they can take away your jewels, they can take away your family, you know, but until they take away your life, they don't take away what you know. And so it's kind of like this form of resistance. It's this form of power. And I also think, um, you know, from, from studying uh, Jewish history in general, you know, this idea of education is it's hope for the next generation. Right. And that's why when, you know, an oppressive regime comes in, the first thing they do is take away your education. And it's like really the scariest thing you could do um, because that's that's the future. You know, and I've, I've worked with enough, you know, individuals who are part of, you know, uh, you know, the Nazi party in some way folks were in part of the Hitler youth that like for the education is also important on that end too, right? They like you educate to put a certain agenda in, in young people's heads. And so it can take all of these different forms, but when the Nazis came into Czechoslovakia, you know, my grandmother said, the war started for me when I couldn't go to school anymore. For her, you know, everyone had a different point of the start of the war, depending on what their life looked like, what country they're from. And for her, it was before World War II ever began, it was when school was no longer possible. So, you know, her schooling ends when she's 13. By that point, she was trilingual because she had gone to a French speaking school, a German speaking school, a Czech speaking school. Um, but then it's, and then in Denmark, she goes and she's living a life on a farm and learning agricultural skills. And after a few years there in her Danish, you know, now, now she knows Danish, um, she, you know, the communication with her parents has stopped and she's starting to say, well, what, you know, my father always said, what's in my head, no one can take away from me. And so she starts writing to boarding schools and saying, you know, I'll be a custodian, I'll clean your toilets, I'll clean the, you know, the, the classrooms, I'll wash the windows in exchange for an education. And that's how important it was for her. So she was said she was the true Cinderella. Um, but, you know, the school did accept her. And then she did the same thing when she had to escape to Sweden. And so this not only was education, I think, a way of staying connected to her family who was murdered, but it was also a way of keeping her life moving forward. That as long as she was learning, as long as she was building towards something, even if she, she didn't know what that was, it was learning was a step forward. And that's what she had to do to survive. Um, you know, and she continued to do that here. But on the other hand, you know, once she got much older and was settled in America for many decades and was a proper American and all that, you know, she started teaching English to Im new immigrants who came into this country. Um, so the classroom remained a part of her life, you know, up until up until her older age. It's really beautiful to hear the power of all that. And um, kind of coming off of Aziza's um, her her own experience of Palestinian uh, drive for education and this and this um, similar thing. I, I want to take us back. You were able to join us for Yusef Bashir's um, uh, presentation on the words of my father. And so we, we chose these two books because they're both memoirs about our family history and um, and present tense, like where we are in the present tense as well. So I'm wondering, as, as you were reading the book, um, I know it was, it was important to you as you were listening to Yusuf, what felt similar to you? Where were the resonances in the stories? And where were the differences for you in the stories? Yeah, first of all, I have it sitting here. This is like one of the best books I've read. It was so good. So I'm, I'm grateful to all of you for, for bringing this into my, my orbit. Um, there were a lot, of, a lot of really interesting things about this book for me, and it connected to my life in a few places. Like back when I was in my early 20s um, and still in the research, more research, less travel phase of this body of work, you know, I did some work with a peace building organization in Israel and Palestine. And, you know, I worked with these communities and that it was only a few years, but it kind of brought me back into that space, which felt, you know, like an important step back for me. Um, but reading it was deeply painful in a way that was really, really important. Um, you know, it was, it was a very, and I have a bunch of pages, um, pages uh, uh, noted here, I'm gonna note one little spot, but um, I actually had my mom read it too. And because we've had this really interesting ongoing conversation for years and years, and I don't think it's ever gonna stop about, you know, what is the appropriate amount of memory? 
And I work in the field of memory. I mean, this is like what I do on day to day basis is talk to people about memory. And I think it's this really important check in constantly is like, at what point is forgetting maybe the, the better way to, uh, to, you know, a, a more peaceful future. And I don't have an answer to that. I just think it's an important place to explore. Um, but I'll just, there was um, a quote that he gave at the start of like one of the um, part five of his book, and it's from the Quran, which says, forgive and forget God loves those who honor him by forgiving and forgive and forget. Like, I don't hear the word forget very often in Jewish culture. I mean, it might be there just where, 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 like I haven't been in, you know, uh, introduced as much, but um, I think this is really interesting because coming from a culture that so deeply preserves our memory and puts such a high value on remembering, like remember, remember is such like a, a Jewish value that the idea that you would throw in maybe forgetting as a value, I think is a really important space to explore. Because if you go back to, you know, the idea of the intergenerational trauma and what our parents carry and what do we carry, you know, there comes a time where it's like, how many generations will it take for some of the pain and the, the hurt? Because pain becomes anger, it becomes fear, it becomes, you know, all these bad feelings, you know, so at what point is maybe the value to be forget and to not remember, um, you know, which feels a little bit nerve wracking for me as someone who's like, you know, spent my entire life thinking about memory <laughs> or, you know, to be like, well, maybe we just stop remembering for a little bit might be helpful. Um, but in that sense, you know, I, I took a lot in terms of really challenging myself to think about a lot of this in different ways. Um, and then I'll also say that, you know, he spent time at Seeds of Peace, which is here in Maine, which is where I live. So, you know, you know, going back to your very first question where it was about the types of connections we make and where we find those connections, like the idea that here's this story that, you know, many in like the political sphere would say we're on opposite sides, which I, I don't buy, um, but coming from these different histories that, you know, in the media often, you know, and in and life, you know, sometimes, you know, hurt each other. Um, well, here's this connection. I don't have that many connections with people from Maine. It's a small state up here. We don't have a lot of people. So, you know, here's this space where like we could come together, forget, you know, forget our family histories. Like we could come together with just like loving the land up here. Um, and so I think that you know, it just, it's one of those like, oh, I have the connection with this person in a completely way that was unexpected when I opened up the book. And that was really special. That's beautiful. Um, and and kind of going back to what you're saying about like the heaviness of the trauma that we might carry or that we carry um, as a reaction to what we've been through and it passing and what we're holding. And like, I think of this moment where we're holding so much right now and the grief just feels like it keeps piling and it's growing bigger and bigger with these really huge, um, like, life altering events, especially for individuals who are going through this. And like, I wonder, like, as our society is grappling with violence and hatred and profound pain, um, is there something about your work or your writing that really feels especially resonant and relevant right now? Unfortunately, it's like kind of like the big thing. A lot of people are saying, oh, your book is so relevant. I'm like, it's not great. Like, that's not really, you know, I guess like from a marketing point, that's good that people, you know, find relevance in it, but it's not really what you want from a story like this. You know, I think the greatest gift would be for people to say it's completely irrelevant and part of the past. You know, I think that's, that's kind of what the hope would be. Um, when I started going into my grandmother's story back in 2009, you know, it, it, there was no relevance politically. I mean, I was also 20 years old. I was younger. I didn't understand the world in the same way. Yes, there was relevance, but not in the way that we have now. And it's just been, you know, increasing year after year and then really hitting ahead around 2015, 2014, 2015, 2016, when the refugee crisis broke out that brought millions up to Europe, like that really started to be a, a turning of the tide in terms of the relevance and just has not stopped. Um, and just speaking to the last few months alone, um, once the war in Ukraine broke out, you know, I've been on this book tour for this for this past year and it is amazing how, like I have not had a single book talk where we haven't spoken about the war in Ukraine, right? So it's, I went from kind of having to be, you know, a expert about a war in the past to suddenly needing to be an expert about the war in the present for there to be 
relevance to the war in the past. And so, you know, just like another another moan of my head kind of spinning a bit. Um, but it's been, I've started working with Ukrainians, actually. I've been working on a project, like collecting testimony from Ukrainians, and I've been getting to speak to all these people. And, you know, I'll, sometimes I'll share my work with them so they know who I, who I am. And a lot of them are like millennials in Kyiv who speak English. And like, we talk about this story and we talk about my grandmother. And it's actually this place that because my grandmother went through this experience, because I've spent time understanding this experience on a deeper level, I'm actually able to connect with these people in Ukraine, even though I'm, you know, nestled up here in New England. And I'm able to have some context of what, you know, of, of kind of maybe not what they're going through, but maybe what could happen next and how might this look as it plays out, like, you know, and be able to better engage in conversations about what makes someone want to flee their home and what makes someone want to stay in their home. And is it what you think? You know, I was having a conversation with a 27 year old woman in Kyiv the other day. And she said to me, she said, you know, I really thought that I would be the person that fled. And yet I can't like imagine leaving right now. And like, that was really interesting. And, you know, all of those things I can relate because, you know, in studying World War II, one of the things that has always stuck with me that somebody said to me once was, you know, the pessimist left and the optimist stayed in Europe. And, um, I, you know, and I, 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 you know, what you think about that today in different contexts. So all of this stuff, you know, unfortunately um, is having like a surge of relevance. And um, I've been trying to navigate what do I do with that? And it's not totally clear to me. And I'm, I, you know, I'm trying to, to keep my wits about me as I think about it. And also, you know, doing that dance of like, how do you make connections to a past without comparing it? Like, I'm really against comparing different wars. I'm really against comparing different communities, prejudice and discrimination and what they've gone through. But I'm very pro making connections. And so that's a delicate line that I'm, you know, trying, trying to sort through as the days go on. For Rachel, I have, I have one more question. Um, something that's been coming up for us a lot recently is um, just this issue of safety and what makes people feel safe. Some people seem to feel much safer with a, a homogeneity of their people. And for some people, it's a heterogeneity uh, and their people become something broader. Mm -hmm. um, and we can see that there's, you know, that there's pretty serious danger in this drive toward homogeneity. There also might be some really important things there. Um, I'm just, I feel like you are somebody who might be able to give us some really important insight around this. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely drawn to people who are different than me. Um, that being said, I live in a pretty homogenous place right now. You know, I've lived in a lot of different places, but I, you know, as somebody said to me, somebody from another country I was talking to on Zoom who didn't speak great English, you know, I told them I lived in Maine and they're like, oh, lobsters and white people. And I was like, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> I was like, you're not wrong. Um, you know, so, and I don't, I don't take any issue in any sort of way of cultural groups and ethnic groups and religious groups and racial groups wanting to live amongst people who share certain backgrounds with them. Like it makes sense why people want to live in neighborhoods that have houses of worship that are for them and where their community spaces would be and have the grocery stores that sell their food. Like I don't I don't believe that it's wrong to want to be in those spaces. I love being in spaces where I feel culturally connected to the people around me. Um, but I do think that in order, like we are living in a very global, you know, in an era of globalization where we are so deeply connected to people across the world. We are so deeply connected in our Instagram feeds and our social media feeds to every terrible, awful thing that's happening and every good and wonderful thing that's happening. And these are people who are come from walks of life. We don't know anything about their backgrounds. And yet we feel like we have a window into their world. And so I think that if we're going to engage in the world in this type of way where globalization is a part of our life and globalization doesn't have to be a bad thing in any way, then we also have a responsibility to 
to really get connected to other people's histories, because if we want to understand them at all in any way in the present, we have to have some little thread of their past just to hold on to. Um, and so I think that's that becomes a responsibility, you know, that if we want to be, you know, seeing people's lives from other countries, we better understand a little bit about the country's history. If we want to be reading news that comes out of different parts of the world, let's understand like what is their relationship been like with the media or politics or this. And I'm not saying like go and read a textbook book about it, but just, you know, be present in understanding what you might not understand and seek that out. Um, and I think it makes the world feel a lot smaller. So, you know, I'll go back to the example of what's happening right now in Ukraine, where because my husband was Polish and he wasn't Jewish, but, you know, we met, we met studying abroad in Jerusalem during that year, many years ago. And so, you know, it's been very interesting because, you know, here he was, he brought me into his family as like a Jewish American vegetarian into like a Polish Catholic meat eating family, you know, and I'm, actually the vegetarian part was probably the hardest in the beginning, but, um, you know, suddenly his family that didn't have any relationship with Jewish people, except for maybe understanding the Holocaust in some capacity, now had a Jewish person in their family. And so, Every time there's been anti-Semitism globally in the past seven, eight years since I've been a part of their family, like they text me. Now I have nephews in Poland who are growing up with some sensitivity towards Jewish issues, anti-Semitism, good things, bad things, whatever. And vice versa, you know, as this war in Ukraine is happening and millions of refugees are flooding across the borders and many of them are ending up in Poland, like I have family members who have refugees living with them now and like, you know, suddenly everything feels smaller. Everything feels more connected. Our empathy just is much comes much more naturally. Um, our compassion comes much deeper. And so, I think that just by seeing each other as neighbors, by treating each other as neighbors, you know, it it's it only does good things. So, so beautifully said. Um, yes, especially as our world grows smaller and our compassion gets to a deeper place. Um, it's like the joy and the pain again in another form. Um, as we kind of bring this part of our program to a close, um, I'm really struck by like that gift that you were talking about that your mom gave you, almost that release. And then towards the end, like your your grandmother actually wrote her own eulogy. And I just found myself so like pulled into it. And I'm hoping you will read that first portion of it um, and just kind of, yeah, take us through and let us hold that moment with you. Yeah, let us, let me let me pull it up here. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's wonderful because so I so many people just like love the fact that she wrote her own eulogy, and it's like one thing that I loved it. But you know, when you love something and other people love it, you're like, oh yeah, this is great. Um, and it's so funny because she wrote it like 15 years before she passed away. And she wrote it because she was pissed off at someone's funeral. She was like, she was like, that was the most impersonal. <laughs> like, I mean, no one's going to do that to me, you know? And like, and what's wonderful about that, I mean, you know, she was like, what, 70, 70, I think when she wrote it, um, was that it was the same type of chutzpah that she had when she was younger and trying to navigate the war. It was like the same type of control that she took over her life where she was like, no one's going to tell me what my life is going to look like. I'm going to control what I can and I'm going to do what I can. And like, in this case, it was like, I'm going to write my own story. And like, you know, and so um, I really love that. So this is, this is just the first uh, couple paragraphs. And then for anyone who hasn't read the book, the, the full thing is towards the end of the book. But so she writes in uh, January, 1996, we all live on borrowed time. Our lives are temporary and most of us try to do our best our best to our parents, our siblings, our spouses, our children and grandchildren, our friends and our community. Some of us succeed for the most part. We do have the strength and the optimism to hope, to go on, to be productive, to be concerned, to love, to discipline, to rejoice and to support. We are putting our hopes in our children and the future generations. They will have the same struggles, agonies and pleasures we had. However, they cannot learn it through us. They have to experience all of the emotions from exhilarating to mournful ones on their own. All we can do is instill in the new generation, a moral fiber, sense of justice, loyalty, love for learning, awe of nature, respect for each other, and the capacity to enjoy life's pleasures and cope with setbacks. All this we give through love and example. 
Mm. Yeah. It feels so right to give her the fun. No word. <laughs> like you've, you've taken us on this journey with her and to just honor her in this space. Um, thank thank you. you. And thank you for joining us. This has really been a oh, gift. Thank you. No, it's been, it's been, um, a really big gift for me as well. I was, when I wrote this book, you know, my, my big hope was that it would be embraced in like the cross-cultural spaces. So this, this just feels really good for me. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. mm, you're welcome. Our pleasure. Now we'll stop the recording. You won't be on, you won't be recorded. Um, and it's really our opportunity to,